So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Nan Aaron, president of Alliance for Justice. Thank you so much for joining the latest in our virtual holding court series featuring leading advocates, lawyers, and elected officials to discuss issues, issues related to our courts, our rights, and our justice system. And thanks also to Alliance's wonderful outreach and communication staffs. Um, we are honored today to be joined by Congressman James Clyburn, the House Majority Whip, uh, we're also thrilled to be joined by Kimberly Atkins Store, senior opinion writer and columnist at the Boston Globe, and Adam Gentleson, author of Kill Switch, The Rise of the Modern Senate and the Crippling of American Democracy. Our discussion today couldn't be more timely. Just yesterday, President Biden in an eloquent address in Philadelphia made clear that our nation faces the worst challenge to our democracy since the Civil War. State after state, from Georgia to Texas, um, we've seen them advance voter suppression laws designed to make it harder for persons of color to exercise the franchise. And just eight years after the bludgeoning of the Voting Rights Act in Shelby County, Republican appointed justices on the Supreme Court this term yet again gutted one of the most important pieces of legislation ever enacted by Congress. The House of Representatives has acted and passed essential legislation to protect our democracy. The American people overwhelmingly support it, as does a majority of the Senate. Yet that bill is not law, and it is because our democracy is being held hostage by a minority, abusing the filibuster to entrench themselves in power. In order to repel the threat to our democracy, reform of the filibuster is necessary. And that is why this conversation today is so important. This is not a new issue for Alliance for Justice. When the Republican minority used the filibuster to block President Obama's highly qualified judicial nominees from getting a vote, we demanded an end to it and Harry Reid ended it. We had no choice then and we have no choice now. In too many critical areas, an extreme minority in Congress is trying to prevent critical legislation in all areas from being enacted. Our conversation today will be moderated by Alliance for Justice's legal director, Daniel Goldberg. Mr. Goldberg previously served as senior counsel to Senator Tom Harkin when Harkin was at the forefront of the fight to change Senate rules over a decade ago when Mitch McConnell did all he could <clears throat> to break government and obstruct President Obama. We'll have a conversation for approximately 45 minutes and then open it up for questions from the audience. You can submit questions throughout the program by emailing rachel at afj.org or use the question and answer submission feature on Zoom. Um, one other point, and that is live captions are also available. And with that, I will turn this over to Daniel Goldberg. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Nan, and just a great honor and privilege to be on this amazing panel, including with the one of the great legislators in our country today, uh, Majority Whip Clyburn. Uh, somebody who has been at the forefront in, in leadership in passing critical legislation through the House of Representatives, um, not just voting rights legislation, but in countless areas um, that if enacted into law would make such a difference in improving the lives of the American people. So really just an honor to, to join you, Congressman, and uh, join Kim and Adam in this critically important conversation. 
I'd like to begin actually um, by talking about the legislation that has passed the House of Representatives. Our constitutional system was designed so that the American people could come together through their elected officials to solve problems facing uh, the public. And yes, to deliberate, yes, to uh, consider various viewpoints, but at the end of the day, to act. Um, unfortunately, far too often because of the abuse of the filibuster in the Senate, uh, the, uh, the filibuster has been transformed into an undemocratic tool uh, preventing the American people from acting. Um, I'd like to get your thoughts uh, initially, uh, Congressman Clyburn and then Kim and Adam, for how can you explain to the people listening today how our government is functioning and not functioning? Um, and the role of the filibuster on the other side of the Capitol plays? Well, you know, you can make the attempt. I don't know if people really understand it. Uh, I, I'm amazed at the number of people who uh, uh, are really still aghast at the fact that um, uh, we have this uh, uh, tremendous, uh, uh, I don't know what to call it, um, uh, the problem with getting uh, legislation done. Uh, uh, people really feel uh, that um, they voted for change uh, last November and they're not getting that change. Uh, and I noticed uh, in recent days, frustration growing uh, significantly, which is one of the reasons I kind of ratchet up uh, my uh, activities over the last several days. Tonight, um, I'm having uh, the fifth uh, of six town hall meetings uh, that I've been having. And it, it's really amazing to listen to people, uh, to experience the level of frustration, that all of which has been complicated by COVID-19. As you know, I chair that select subcommittee as well. And, and I can tell you, uh, we are in uh, at an inflection point uh, in our history. The president said uh, on, in his great speech uh, the other day that, um, uh, you know, this is the, uh, I think he likened this and it's the most serious uh, democratic issue since the Civil War. Many of you may recall back during the campaign last year, I call last year's campaign as the most consequential since 1850. Um, uh, 1860. And I said that about 1860 because that's when Abraham Lincoln was elected. Uh, and if you, and that's what changed the direction of things. Uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, both of them he signed in 1860, well, one of them is 1862, the other most piece of le uh, legislation. But you know, uh, we are at that kind of a point today. And another thing I think we have to get people to understand um, uh, uh, people think that Reconstruction was this thing that uh, started after the Civil War and continued right up into the 1900s. Few people realized this it was on a 12 year deal. Uh, Reconstruction was over after 1877. Uh, and then we were stuck then with Jim Crow laws. And so when the president calls this more than Jim Crow, he is absolutely correct. Uh, because if you look at uh, what ushered into Jim Crow uh, and what uh, really caused all those things that we are highlighted by the 1921 uh, uh, Tulsa riot. But you go back and you will see uh, that that was just the latest one, uh, maybe the most high profile one. But we are uh, at a, an inflection point in the country today. So, uh... <clears throat> For voting rights or other piece of legislation to become law, right now, 60 US senators, including 10 Republicans, have to agree to it because of the filibuster. Um, Adam, I want to turn to you to give a little sense of the history of the filibuster. 
I think when most people think of the filibuster, they probably think of the climax of the classic film, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, where Jimmy Stewart's character single-handedly uses the filibuster to stop a piece of corrupt legislation. Um, but the reality is that in 1939, the year that movie was made, there were zero filibusters in the Senate. Um, so I think most people think the filibuster is in the Constitution, and the idea of a supermajority to enact legislation is just common practice throughout history. Um, can you give our listeners a sense of what is perhaps unique about the current moment we're in? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that the number one thing for people to understand is that this idea that it requires 60 votes for bills to pass in the Senate is a very recent development um, and was not what the framers intended at all. Um, you mentioned Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. I think, you know, in, in some ways that movie did a, did a very uh, dramatic disservice to the filibuster because it sort of whitewashed its use. Um, you mentioned that it came out in 1939. Uh, in 1937, when the movie was in production and right before it came out, uh, the filibuster was used to stop an anti-lynching bill uh, that had passed the House of Representatives, that was supported by a majority in the Senate, uh, and was ready to be signed uh, by the president at the time. Um, the, Mr. Smith portrayed it as this noble cause, but the fact is that during the Jim Crow era, when the movie came out, um, the only category of legislation that the filibuster was used to stop bills altogether were civil rights bills. Uh, uh, Congressman Clyburn mentioned, you know, the end of Reconstruction 1877. Well, from the end of Reconstruction 1877 until 1964, the only bills that were stopped by the filibuster were civil rights bills. For those 87 years, that was the case. Other bills on other categories occasionally would run into a filibuster, but on those bills, uh, the issue was quickly resolved. The filibuster would usually go away within a timely fashion, and the bills eventually came up for a majority rule vote. Um, so, you know, just to briefly sort of give a sense of the history, you know, there was no supermajority threshold in the original Senate. The framers were very clear that they didn't want one to exist. Um, they were wrong about a lot of stuff, but they were right about this when it came to system design. Um, they had just seen what happened in the Articles of Confederation, which did contain a supermajority threshold, and it led to gridlock, not consensus. So they didn't want there to be a supermajority threshold in, in the Senate. Um, for the entire 19th century, there was no supermajority threshold. Every single bill that came up for a vote in the Senate passed or failed on a majority vote throughout the entire 19th century and well into the 20th century. Um, during the Jim Crow era, the only bills that ever had to clear a supermajority threshold in order to pass um, were civil rights bills. The only bills that failed on supermajority thresholds were civil rights bills. Um, and it only started to be in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s that it slowly became more accepted for this supermajority standard to be applied to bills other than civil rights. But even then, it was applied at a much lower rate than it is today. Its use uh, on everything that comes before the Senate was something that Mitch McConnell started and has normalized. So to the extent that we accept this as a reality of our political system today, it's important for people to understand uh, that this is a relatively recent de development. Those who defend the filibuster talk about Senate tradition, um, but really Senate tradition is for bills to be de debated for an extended period of time, but to eventually come up for a majority rule vote. That is what the framers intended, and that is how the Senate uh, could go back to functioning if, if senators decided to enact some reforms. So, Cam, uh, based on that history that takes us to the present day, and really this, this existential fight for our democracy, uh, President Biden alluded to it um, quite eloquently in his remarks yesterday. Congressman Clyburn talked um, about the history and really the crossroads we are at for our democracy. Um, for our listeners, can you articulate why it's so important that legislation pass the House, the Senate, and be signed by President Biden um, to address uh, the Voting Rights Act, to address uh, some of the voter suppression tactics, and why some of the measures like litigation or um, voter registration just might be insufficient? Yeah, so we are at a really critical point, and I think the history, as uh, Adam painted out, is crucially uh, important in understanding this point. For the filibuster itself, the debate over the filibuster uh, among Democrats in the Senate 
uh, who are divided over it. And, and per discussions that I have, we, we hear a lot about two senators have spoken in opposition to that. I am told that there are more, but they are letting those two speakers uh, speak on their behalf. So there is a split. I don't know exactly how deep it is, but when you hear those who speak publicly about it, they point to uh, a few factors. One, this desire to have bipartisanship, that legislation is stronger when it is passed on a bipartisan basis, that that is important for the protection of democracy. And you need that consensus building. Without the filibuster, it would be difficult to build that consensus. I think where we stand now and in recent history, we have seen that that sort of consensus building um, has been hard to come by for many years now and certainly was really never uh, a, a, a factor uh, with the respect to the filibuster itself. I think there is this um, sort of idealized notion that this rule that requires 60 senators to agree to an end debate on a bill and to move forward on a debate on debate would foster that kind of uh, bipartisanship, would foster that kind of consensus building. We just haven't seen that, certainly not in past history, as Adam pointed out, and also not in recent history. I will give an example. One way that you would think that this would work really well would be for judicial nominees, right? When you nominate, when the president nominates somebody to the federal judiciary, be it the lower court or the Supreme Court, in order to build consensus around that candidate, that 60 vote margin should encourage a president to do, for example, what uh, Barack Obama did in 2016, which is nominate someone like Merrick Garland, someone who certainly is not a judicial activist by any uh, measure, not on the left or right, somebody who he should be able to go to the Senate and talk to Republicans and, Senate and uh, Democrats and say, look, this is a qualified person, so why don't you back them and give them a strong lopsided uh, vote in favor. That didn't happen because Mitch McConnell was intent on blocking that nominee, no matter who he was. He was not going to let Barack Obama fill that seat. Mitch McConnell, likewise, when we led what led to the Senate filibuster uh, being ended for judicial nominees, likewise had blocked a number of Barack Obama's nominees to the DC circuit and other courts. There was a log jam. The judges were not going through, which fast forward several years later, allowed President Donald Trump with the assistance of Mitch McConnell to put more judges in the federal bench than any other president of any party had done in generations. And that is why we have the, le the far right leaning federal judiciary that we have today. So the rules have long been broken. The ideals that may have given uh, folks like Joe Manchin or Kirsten Sinema um, may have made the arguments that they're putting forward seem reasonable. They're just not the reality here in Washington. It just isn't how it works. So if you want to pass anything, including civil rights, uh, uh, civil rights or voting rights legislation, the Democrats are in control of the House, of the Senate, and of the White House. And the only thing standing in the way for them to put forward this very high uh, policy agenda, one that should be uh, a top policy agenda, is this one rule that is not grounded in the Constitution and it is within the power of the Democrats to change if they want to. I will just say one more thing, um, and then we'll probably talk about this more later, you alluded to the Supreme Court uh, eight years ago, gutting a crucial part of the Voting Rights Act, which allowed the Department of Justice to pre-clear rules, pre-clear new laws that you see, like the ones that are being passed uh, by the hundreds in states across the country to make sure that they were not discriminatory against black and brown folks before they could go into effect. The Supreme Court essentially with a decision that said, well, you know, it's not the 60s anymore. Um, we don't really need to do this, gutted that part of the law. Then just a few weeks back, the Supreme Court was back with the remaining uh, enforcement mechanism for the Voting Rights Act, which allowed once these laws were already in effect, once the damage was already potentially being done, people to sue, to claim that these laws were racially discriminatory. The Supreme Court raised the standard made it very difficult to make that case. Essentially all lawmakers in states have to do is say, well, you know what, we don't want, we don't want fraud. 
and we're trying to protect against fraud. And more likely than not, that's going to be a justifiable reason, even when there's not a scintilla of evidence of fraud taking place. So this is where we are. Voting is going to be made more difficult, despite the fact that through a pandemic, a record number of people last year showed what could happen when access to voting is expanded. There was no evidence of widespread fraud. More people voted than ever. That's what American democracy should be about, but that's being rolled back dramatically. And it's really remarkable that this one rule, the filibuster, is the one thing that can make the difference in uh, <coughs> folks in Congress passing laws that would protect these rights. So, so Congressman, um, given the face of a hostile court system, um, just last week getting the, the Voting Rights Act, where you see sweeping voting suppression laws passed state after state. Um, we've all been inspired by the, the Democratic legislators in Texas uh, doing all they can to protect the right to vote in the franchise in that state. Um, when restrictions on the franchise are disproportionately affecting communities of color and young voters, um, you responded. You know, thanks to your leadership, democracy reform has passed the House. Um, but Mitch McConnell and the Senate Republicans are doing everything they can to prevent it from becoming law. Um, what reforms would you like to see uh, to secure passage of uh, these critical democratic protections um, in the Senate? You know, I'm a guy uh, that really can appreciate tradition. Um, but tradition is just that, tradition. Uh, it's not law. Uh, I think it's high time that we really reform the filibuster. Now, uh, because I am a traditionalist in some, to some extent, uh, I can understand uh, uh, a filibuster uh, taking place uh, on legislative matters to give people time uh, to gather the votes uh, to their side. Uh, but I also support what the president uh, says he's supporting. That is what they call a standing filibuster. Uh, I call it being present uh, to filibuster. Uh, and that's what Strom Thurmond did back in 1957 when he broke the record. Uh, but now you can sit downtown in the spa uh, somewhere and pick up the telephone. And you see the filibuster and never have to walk to the floor and never have to even show your hands, so to speak. Uh, so we need reform. Now we've done it to keep the full faith and credit of the United States from being jeopardized when it comes to the budget. Uh, reconciliation is a word that's much better used uh, for constitutional issues than for the budget issues. Uh, so uh, why not have uh, this kind of exception for constitutional issues uh, that would include the vote? And I, you know, I, uh, Kimberly, I know the argument that they use, but I remind people that the 15th Amendment, the amendment that gave uh, the former slaves the right to vote, the 15th Amendment passed by one party was not a bipartisan vote. And so um, uh, this notion that, uh, and I've, I've told this to my friend, the Senator from West Virginia, uh, I've had discussions with him about this and I've told him, you got to check. Uh, these so-called, you need bipartisan support in order for a thing uh, to be strong and, and vibrant and uh, accepted by everybody. It just does not hold water. That's not true. Uh, if you go back to the 60s and you will see that. Now, people have to remember when they tell me about, uh, as Kevin McCarthy did on the floor the other day, talking about, we were talking about the monuments, but I mean, the Democrats for all of that stuff, well, those Democrats that did that left the party because the, the, the majority of the Democratic Party said, we aren't going to be that kind of a party anymore. And we're going to pass these civil rights laws. That's when Strom Thurmond left. He filibustered as a Democrat in 57. He left after the 1964 uh, Civil Rights Act. Uh, so we, uh, that's what bothered me so much about the so-called critical race theory. These theories or just that theorists. They aren't factual, they don't hold law, uh, uh, hold water when it comes to the law. So I guess what I'm saying, we gotta reform the filibuster. Uh, and, and I just uh, think 
that, you know, I got a nice little text last night uh, from Harry Reid. You know, and, and he said in one sentence, thanks for what you're doing. It's not a matter of if, but when the filibuster is going to be reformed. So if we don't do it, if Schumer doesn't do it, the moment Mitch McConnell gets a chance, it's going to be done. And so let's just finish that. Down here in the South, we always say your best, the best way to, to predict uh, future behavior is by past performance. And I think the past That's a great pivot to Adam, who was with Harry Reid in 2013. Uh, when Senator Reid and the Democrats abolished the filibuster on executive um, and judicial nomination short of the Supreme Court. Um, what factors led to Reid's decision to get rid of them, the, the filibuster then? Do you see parallels to now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, yes, Senator Reid is, is uh, you know, very, very still committed to, to this fight and to seeing reform through. Um, uh, but I, I think it gets back to something that, that Kimberly said earlier, which is that, you know, the reason that that senators decided that it was incumbent upon them to reform the filibuster in 2013 was that Republicans were not filibuster, were not blocking judicial nominees, uh, were not blocking President Obama's judicial nominees due to their qualifications. They were blocking his judicial nominees because they wanted to see President Obama fail in every aspect <clears throat> of the presidency uh, and treating him differently than they had than any previous president had been treated by the Senate opposition party, whether they were Republican or Democrat. And, uh, you know, what became very clear by 2013 was that it didn't matter how qualified these nominees were. Um, the, those who were being blocked had sterling qualifications. Often what would happen was they would get filibustered. And in the cases where we had the votes to overcome the filibuster, Republicans would turn around and vote for these nominees on the final vote. There, was, there were uh, over 100 nominees who were eventually confirmed on unanimous votes who nonetheless had to overcome filibusters. Um, so manifestly, Republicans' objections were not to their qualifications. They just wanted to slow everything down to see that President Obama could fail. And in November 2013, when we decided to reform the filibuster, when senators voted to do so, at that point, President Obama was on pace to have the fewest judicial nominees confirmed of any president going back to Ronald Reagan and probably before, although the data only goes back to Reagan. So what we did by reforming the filibuster was it allowed Senate Democrats to rush through a wave of confirmations in the year and a half that we still had the Senate majority and to put President Obama on par with his predecessors by the time that he left office. Um, what people forget about that move is that is what Democrats gained from that move. We gained um, a huge number of judicial nominees who were confirmed. Uh, it was the most diverse set of nominees ever confirmed to that point. Um, and that left far fewer vacancies for Trump to fill uh, when he and McConnell got back into power. Um, McConnell then went ahead and got rid of the filibuster. And as, as Congressman Clyburn said, I think, you know, uh, past behavior is, is predictive of future behavior. Um, he put it better than I, than I did just there. But, um, you know, McConnell, as soon as the filibuster stood in his way, he got rid of it with a, with a flick of the wrist. And the idea that if Democrats had not gotten rid of it in 2013, um, the idea that McConnell would have then sat around and let Democrats filibuster Trump's judicial nominees without going nuclear himself, uh, you know, I think if, if you buy that notion, I, I would like to sell you a bridge in Brooklyn. So all that is to say, if, if Democrats hadn't gotten rid of the filibuster in 2013, President Obama would have left office with the fewest judicial nominees confirmed of any president in the past 40 years. Um, and then McConnell would have just got, gone ahead and got rid of himself and confirmed all the nominees that Trump got confirmed anyway. So I think that's important for people to keep in mind as they consider, you know, the risk reward proposition of, of this move. It is certainly a major reform. It is not something to be done lightly. But I think that when you look at um, what Democrats stand to gain, um, the gains are enormous. We're talking about the right to vote in this country. Um, and the risks are something that probably are going to happen anyway. I think Congressman Clyburn is completely right when he says that McConnell will just go ahead and get rid of the filibuster as soon as it suits his purposes. So, you know, if you gain something major and you don't lose anything that you weren't going to lose anyway, um, I think the risk reward proposition nets out uh, pr pretty clearly in that scenario. Um, I want to flesh out that, uh, and Kim, I've heard from a lot of friends who we'll look back in 2013 and say shortly thereafter, we lost the presidency, we lost the Senate, and Trump administrations began packing the courts and there was very little that, that Democrats could do about it. Um, 
And I know a lot of my friends have feared that the same thing will happen if we reform the filibuster now. Yes, we might be able to pass voting rights legislation, but think about all the untoward things that a Republican president and Republican Congress can do. Um, what would you say to them? I co-sign everything that the Congressman and Adam said that everything, when someone tells you who they are, believe them. Mitch McConnell has made it abundantly clear that he will use any lever at his disposal to advance the Republican agenda. We've already seen him do it. We've already seen him, uh, you know, ponder uh, about not confirming Supreme Court appointments if vacancies arise, not just in in 2024, but in 2023. So if you think that the filibuster, he will say, oh, well, no, tradition, I'm not gonna touch that. I, I just don't think that that uh, makes any logical sense based on based on what we have seen in the past. And I do think it is, is important to say, look, for people who want to want more gradual movement in special, especially with uh, traditions that are in the Senate, they can, there are other things besides just full elimination of the filibuster, as we talked about. It can be limited to civil rights issues. It could be limited to voting issues. It's a rule in the Senate. The, the people in charge can make the rule whatever they want it to be. They can do a gradual limitation. And then afterwards, if the Republicans go farther, well, that's on them and history will have to judge them on that. But in the meantime, this very important issue, and, and I also wanna stress, Voting rights, to, to my consternation um, as a journalist and as somebody who's not enrolled in any party, is always uh, sort of presented as this Republican versus Democrat issue because that's the way that it usually pans out on which side folks are on. Expanding access to the vote, expanding the right to vote helps everyone vote. You know who is difficult to, uh, it's difficult for folks who are poor in rural areas. That's a lot of white people. This will make it harder for them to vote too. This is expanding the vote, not just for black folks, not just for people who tend to vote democratic, but for everyone. It protects everyone's right to vote. So when you, when it's presented factually uh, in that way, it makes the stakes here even greater. I mean, I think a lot about the fact that it took not one, but two constitutional amendments to ensure my ability to vote. And I think that's the thing that Americans should think about when this, as this debate uh, plays out. As Senator Harkin often said in, in kind of response to the argument uh, that we could lose the presidency in the Senate someday, is as progressives, we're the ones who also need a functioning government. Uh, that there was a reason that Mitch McConnell did not end the legislative filibuster and that's they didn't have a great legislative agenda. Um, their agenda was tax cuts, which they could do through reconciliation and judges, which couldn't be filibustered. It's the Democrats, it's the progressives who actually have a, a positive agenda that needs a functioning government. Um, I want to, to get back to uh, voting rights. So the Texas Democrats clearly made headlines in their efforts to protect voting rights by leaving the state and denying Republicans a two thirds majority required by the state constitution to conduct business. Beyond filibuster reform, what other tools are available uh, to those of us who care deeply about the right to vote? Um, what tools are available to you, Congressman Clyburn and Congressional Democrats in the White House to protect voting rights in states like Texas? Well, the tools uh, that are available are in those pieces of legislation that we can't get to. <laughs> so <laughs> they are there. So the very first thing uh, that opens all of us up uh, is to reform the filibuster. Uh, I'd like everything that's in HR 1. I know. Uh, the things like public financing of, of campaigns, uh, I don't see that getting uh, through the Senate. Uh, you know, we can talk all we want about dark money. Uh, you know, Citizens United, um, uh, we overturned that in HR1. I don't know what's going to happen. There are a lot of things in HR1 that I think uh, you can put in S1 and work. And I'm one of those who believe very strongly uh, that H.R. 4 needs to be applied, that is the uh, uh, pre-clearance section uh, part of, of H.R. 4, need to be applied to all 50 states. 
And let me tell you why. When you deal with HR4, we've, we've done all the work that's necessary. I think we had seven states covered uh, in 1965. Uh, the, the, the reform stuff that we did um, extends it out and, and, and include 11 states. Uh, and, and 11 states still leave a bunch of states out there, including Pennsylvania. But Pennsylvania uh, is now showing us uh, who it is. And so you got Pennsylvania going out there to Arizona, uh, saying that they're going to mimic what they're doing in Arizona. Under HR4, Pennsylvania would not be covered. So we need to do pre-clearance in such a way, and Joe Manchin tells me he's for that. So let's make it apply to all 50 states. If you did that, we don't need to be going through this raid of doing all of this research. Now, I know uh, Kimberly is a lawyer, and a lot of people, I'm not a lawyer, but I know this. Uh, I know that developing this record is because you're singling states out. If you aren't singling the states out, then we say all 50 states would have to be subjected to pre-clearance. You don't need to develop this record. That's pretty clear to me. So uh, all the tools we need, you can find in HR1 and HR4, none of which you can get to without a carve out of the filibuster. So that's why I'm saying reforming the filibuster. I'm not saying eliminate the filibuster. It must be reformed. And we can come back after 2022 and see can we get the votes necessary to eliminate it. And Dan, can I just make another question to that point about going far beyond the states that were covered uh, by the pre-clearance rule? We saw with the uh, horrific events on January 6th, what happened? That happened amid an effort to deny counting the votes, primarily of black folks in places like Milwaukee, in places like Detroit. These are not pre-clearance states. You know, Detroit is, is, I grew up in Detroit. It most definitely was not the South. But what you're seeing not only uh, it is, is the Congressman right, the, the legality of this is that if it's a, it is applied across the board, you don't have that same formula that needs to be approved. But there is a need to protect the right to vote, the, the, to ensure that black and brown folks in particular uh, in places like uh, you know, Philadelphia, uh, their votes are counted. We have evidence of that from what tried, what was attempted on January 6th. So I think that's a very important point. I, I would just try, it reminds me of what, what George Wallace said in, you know, when George Wallace, the governor of Alabama stood in the schoolhouse door at the University of Alabama to prevent integration. He, after he took that stand, he started getting telegrams from all over the country uh, supporting his stand. And he had an epiphany and he said, my God, the entire United States is Southern. And that's what led him to try to run for president. Absolutely. And you know, this, this is not, the, the desire to deny black and brown people the right to vote is not something that is limited to the South. And so we're seeing that right. that today uh, in states across the nation and we can't afford let the states off the hook here. Everybody needs to be held accountable to the same standards. So I just, I would just put my voice in agreement with Kimberly and Congressman Clyburn on this point. Uh, Congressman, are you confident, hopeful, uh, cautiously optimistic that uh, Senator Manchin and Senator Cinema have heard you, have have heard the the existential crisis our democracy and it's in, and some reform is possible out of the Senate. I, I he might be frozen. Let me ask Kim and Adam uh, that question while we um, are addressing technical yeah. issues with the congressman. No, I'm not at all confident <laughs> <laughs> that anything will happen again if passed as prologue. Um, I, I, in the 15 years that I've been in Washington, D.C. covering this Congress, I am not in any way confident uh, that this, this barrier will be uh, eliminated. Yeah, I, I, I've, I think that what we want to see, and I think where the rubber really meets the road on this issue, is when you sort of put the two issues together, the question of reforming the filibuster and, um, you know, the at very acute question of will voting rights pass? And we haven't gotten to that point.
point yet. We're still, even this late in the game, having the debate in the abstract sense where Cinema and Mansion could defend the filibuster on its own terms as something that promotes bipartisanship, even though it doesn't, um, and then talk about voting rights separately. And what we're working towards is a, is a point of convergence where these two things will come together and it will become very clear, you know, it, you saw it on S1 where they, S1 was filibuster, they didn't support reform, but then there's still this prospect of a bipartisan compromise and diffusing some of the provisions of HR4 to HR1 as Congressman Clyburn talked about. So we're still going through that process. When that process yields a compromise um, that is acceptable to all parties, at least on the Democratic side, <laughs> then you're going to have the question come to a head where it will be very clear that the filibuster is the only thing standing in the way of passing a voting rights bill in this country. And so I am very keen to see what happens with Senator Manchin Sinema's position when it becomes clear that their support for the filibuster is literally the only thing preventing a voting rights bill from being passed. We know that's the case in the abstract, but it has not come to a head on the floor in a vote in a way that focuses, uh, as it has, a, has a tendency to focus senators' minds in a different way. So I think we're still working towards that point, and that is where I'm hopeful that you will uh, perhaps see some movement, especially if the president uh, is willing to um, take a take a firmer stand on, on reforming the filibuster there. Congressman, welcome back. I know we had some technical issues. Sure. Um, the question I had asked, I think, when you froze was, um, are you hopeful? your conversations with Congress, with uh, senators, with Senator Manchin and Senator Sinema. Are you hopeful that um, this existential moment uh, when really our democracy is at risk, the franchise for so many Americans is, is threatened, are you hopeful um, that some reform will pass the Senate and a voting rights legislation will get to the president's desk? Yes, I am. Uh, and I think a lot depends upon whether or not we can all uh, come together uh, with the admission that uh, uh, we are on a thousand mile journey uh, and we've got to take uh, this journey one step at a time. And so I would hope that we will begin to focus on what is needed uh, for 2022. And that's let's get reform done. And this whole, every time the argument comes up, it says, should we reform the filibuster? No, we should get rid of the filibuster. Well, the fact of the matter is, you're not going to get rid of the filibuster with the number of votes we've got. You're just not going to get rid of it. And it bothers me so much because back, I was around back in 1964. Uh, when we passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, voting was in it when it started out, housing was in it. We tossed all of that stuff. And then we got the 64 Civil Rights Act that everybody said was a great act, but we didn't get voting until a year later. We didn't get housing until three years later. It didn't get to the public sector until eight years later. It was 18, 1972 uh, when we did that. And everybody treated it as if it was all done in one fell swoop. It was not all done in one fell swoop. We are not gonna get this filibuster thing done in one fell swoop, and let's just Let's stop that and let's start looking at whether or not we want to do. There's a big difference to me in incrementalism uh, and gradualism. We can do this thing with increments uh, and that not, will not be violating uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, edict uh, of gradualism. Um, so what can our listeners what can voters across the country who are feeling that sense of urgency, um, that sense that our democracy at risk and um, oh, feel so passionately that we have to push back on voter suppression. What actions can people across the country do to help you congressmen convince 50 senators to pass reform and get a, a critical legislation to the president? You're asking me? All three of you. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I'll, Go ahead, Adam. You, you, sure. <laughs> you, you've been at a, a higher level of congressional action than I've been. <laughs> you know, than the number you know three right. person in the house? <laughs> <laughs> you got a promotion, Adam. No, yeah, that's... Oh, no. <laughs> I depend upon staff. I know that this is all about. 
that's kind of you to say, but but absolutely not true. But but thank you, Congressman. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I mean, look, as 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 yes, as you know, someone who watches how these decisions are made sometimes. I mean, look, pressure works, and um, you know, members respond to what they're hearing from their constituents. And I think, you know, what regardless of whether your senator already supports filibuster reform or uh, is on the thousand mile journey to to get there eventually, hopefully. Um, you know, it's important for them to hear from it. And I think, especially on this issue, because this this is something that is easy for members of Congress to perhaps think is a procedural issue. It's something that's off in the weeds, um, and maybe is not something that is that is you know uh, connecting with people um, on a on a visceral emotional level. And I think making it clear that it is is important, even if they already support it. I think asking them to go be an advocate uh, and to to take their stance and to try to persuade their colleagues who are still reluctant. Um, you know, member to member communication, member to member persuasion is highly effective. Um, and I think that asking members who already support it to become a champion, to become an advocate for filibuster reform uh, is, is important. But, you know, we, we don't have a lot of time. Um, you know, that the census transmits its data to states on August 16th. And at that point, states will start releasing gerrymandered uh, maps. And, you know, after that point, um, it becomes harder and harder to undo the damage that's done. So I think that um, taking whatever action folks are willing to take now uh, is very, very important because um, this is an important issue. Uh, it's in, it, perhaps the most important issue and the clock is ticking. We don't have a lot of time right now. Yeah, I mean, I think that that is true. I will also say on the flip side, I do hear from people, from voters who express exasperation because they say, we did that. We did that in 2020. You told us to vote and we voted. And still, here we are. We're not seeing the changes that we want. So yes, I do think that uh, that pressure, that action is important. But um, it is true that, that those folks are getting weary uh, of the wait and uh, believe that they have already held up their part of the bargain and want the lawmakers that they elect to hold up theirs. It's not just the voters. Uh, I got a talk, a phone call this morning from Senator Warnock. Uh, he's very, very nervous. He, 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 you know, he's not been around this legislative process very long. Uh, I told him this morning, and I said, okay, uh, continue to pray, Reverend, but I'm acting. <laughs> yeah. We got to fight this thing. Get up off your knees and, and, and fight. Go up there. Uh, pray right now before you leave. He, he called me from the gym. I said, go in the corner somewhere and pray, and then go upstairs uh, in, in the Senate uh, office building and, and sit Schumer down and tell him it's time for us to, to act. Because he's exasperated. I'm reminded, Adam, of 2013, where the caucus was not for reform until the caucus was for reform. Yep. Uh, that, and in many ways, Mitch McConnell was the one who forced the issue, that his um, blind obstruction of the DC nominees, the DC circuit, where they made clear that Barack Obama could have nominated the reincarnated body of John Marshall, and they would have blocked him. Um, that that level of obstruction forced the caucus, including reluctant members who never would have thought they'd support till bus reform to do so. Yes, that's right. You know, and I was actually looking at this earlier today, Dan, and, you know, I was reminded that, so we went, we, you know, executed the, the nuclear option reform on November 21st, 2013, right? And key senators who were opposed to the filibuster, publicly opposed, did not flip and support filibuster reform until November 19th which was literally two days before we actually reformed the filibuster. Um, I was you know, doing communications for Senator Harry at the time, and I remember driving to work that day, reporters texting me furiously trying to find out if we were actually going to go nuclear people. And I don't think we ever confirmed that we were until Senator Reid actually did the process on the Senate floor. I think his action was the confirmation. So all that is to say, um, you know, two things. One is uh, senators are against it until the last minute, and then all of a sudden they're for it. And then it happens. 
Uh, and then when when that change occurs, you know, mansion and cinema, if they're going to shift, are not going to shift till the very last minute. And then when they shift, the vote will probably occur within a day or two. Um, so, you know, pressure works um, to, to voters who are frustrated. I hear that completely and completely understand it. But I would also say that enormous amount of progress has been made here. You know, look at Senator Amy Klobuchar, for instance, um, who was opposed to filibuster reform mm -hmm. during the 2020 presidential primary when she was running. Um, now she's a powerful advocate for reform, um, and that is major progress. So, in you know, we're, we're down to a small handful of senators who are opposed, but just getting to the fact that we have that small handful is enormous progress. That is due to the work that people on the ground are doing. Um, their work matters. Uh, it has gotten us this close. Um, getting these last few votes was always going to be extraordinarily difficult, um, but we really are close. We really have made an enormous amount of progress, and the work that people are doing really has mattered to help us get get us this close. Um, but I just say some of that some yeah. of that pressure must come from within, and I said this in the morning like this one. I, I'm pleased to see that 3.5 trillion dollar infrastructure uh, package that this that the uh, uh, for reconciliation that they've uh, come up with. Uh, Manchin got a lot of stuff in that bill. And I said to Warnock this morning, they need your vote for that. And you need their vote uh, for um, uh, if, uh, for reform uh, of the filibuster. So let's trade votes. Um, a reminder in uh, the remaining minutes we have, if, you, if the audience has a question, uh, please email Rachel uh, dot bracken at afj.org. It's in the chat. Uh, we do have some time for some audience questions. And here is actually a question from the audience. Um, what other issues are at stake? Um, we've talked a lot about voting rights and the existential moment we're in for, for our democracy. Um, but in Congressman, the House of Representatives has passed scores of legislation that um, designed to protect well, workers, consumers, healthcare, um, improve education, um, the, the protect the environment, the list goes on and on. Um, sure. So this is not just a, a question of government functioning for to pass voting rights legislation. Well, I just mentioned that $3.5 trillion program, that's gonna be subject to uh, a reconciliation. And I think so much of what you just mentioned uh, you will find uh, in that program. But what you're not going to find is the George Floyd Justice and Police and I. It's not in there. That needs to be done. Um, we only have a partial uh, uh, part of uh, broadband that needs to be done. Uh, if COVID-19 has done anything, is exposed uh, uh, to me uh, that broadband to the 21st century uh, is what electricity was uh, to the 20th century. Uh, we're in a new uh, place now, and tradition uh, is not going to carry the day. We're going to have to be futuristic with our infrastructure stuff, and infrastructure, they got to be more than roads and bridges and water and sewage and ports and rail. It's got to be school construction. It's got to be affordable housing, and it's got to be broadband. Cam, yeah, I mean, just to be clear, anything that is not uh, tied to the budgetary process is subject to the filibuster. So any right. piece of legislation from police reform to any of the things that uh, Congressman Clyburn just ticked off, it is only things that uh, the, the Senate parliamentarian decides is closely tied enough to a budget measure that can be passed just with a simple majority. So yes, it's absolutely important to remember that the filibuster issue is much broader than voting rights, but voting rights is the one issue that just brings it into the clearest focus. Absolutely. I, I would I would just add, you know, and I, I, listen, I, I I support you know total you know elimination of the filibuster, but I but what Congressman Clyburn said earlier, I think is 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 something I agree with, which is that look, you, you do what you got the votes for. My my Senate practitioner self, you know, take takes over at this point, and you know, look, you get you get I think you know carve out for for um, voting rights is probably what is uh, achievable at at this point. Um, but what's important about that, too, is that once senators start going down the path of reform, um, I think it's likely that they will continue going um, to achieve some of the other things that, that are achievable through, through reconciliation. So, you know, that, um, that first vote to reform and to do a carve out is critical. It will have the immediate impact of allowing us to pass 
voting rights. Um, perhaps you could even shape it to allow other things like DC statehood uh, to, to pass as well. Um, but, but you know, it is going to be an iterative process. This is how reform happens. This is how it works. Um, and having senators go through the process of casting that reform vote, seeing what's on the other side of it, that they can actually get things done, that they can follow through on the promises, um, that there isn't some magic blowback because it's not bipartisan, um, because voters don't actually care about that. You know, that is all part of the education process that people have to go through to, to achieve reform and change of this magnitude. So there is a lot at stake here. Uh, even if the initial step is, is is limited, I think it's critically important both to achieve voting rights and um, to start that process of, of reform that I think will continue uh, once you're past that. Another question from the audience is gets at this question. I, we hear this a lot that ending the filibuster would make the Senate just like the House, heaven forbid, um, that it would be pure majoritarianism, the minority might as well leave town because the majority can do whatever it wants anytime it wants. Um, what tools would still exist um, to um, keep the Senate a, a deliberative body? Um, that cooling saucer metaphor from I think George Washington, um, what checks would still exist in the system for um, for the minority party? Well, I'll take that one. I, I mean, I, look, I, I think if that were true, you know, you sort of flip it around. The filibuster didn't exist for most of the Senate's existence, um, and then only was applied in major ways to civil rights throughout the Jim Crow era into the 1960s. So if getting rid of the filibuster would make the Senate just like the House, then I guess it was just like the House for 200 years, um, which it wasn't. And you know what's important to understand about our, our system is that uh, the framers never intended the filibuster to be one of the checks and balances that they designed. Um, the checks and balances were the having a bicameral legislature, having three branches of government, having you know different age requirements for the House and Senate, having longer terms in the Senate, having only a third of the body be up for election every two years, whereas the whole House is up for re-election every two years. Um, you know all those checks would still exist. And when you compare our system of government to other systems around the world, um, our system still has more checks and balances in it than any other modern democracy, even if you remove the filibuster completely. So all of those checks that would remain are the checks that the framers intended. The filibuster is the check they did not intend. Um, getting rid of it would return our system to what they intended, which was a deliberative system that was capable of being thoughtful and deliberative, but would actually get things done. Um, the filibuster is what tilts that system into dysfunction. So all of the checks and balances, all of the things that makes the Senate different from the House would still exist, um, but you would actually have a, a body that was capable of functioning again. And I think the big one, the biggest one of those things is the fact that uh, in the Senate, uh, you know, Wyoming has the same say as California or New York. I mean, that in itself makes it so drastically different from the House. And that in itself, you know, there's there's a lot of talk that that in, uh, shows that even if the filibuster is eliminated, it's not just going to be majority rule. Um, it, that is one of the, the, the things that the framers envisioned uh, to keep that as the cooling saucer of the Congress. So it, it would, yes, it would not certainly devolve into uh, chaos. And, and also it was worth noting that the House is the only body that's passing legislation right now. So to say that the Senate might become Maybe more like the House, I don't know. Maybe that's not a bad thing. Um, and as a member of the House, that might not be a bad thing. <laughs> so we're at five o'clock. Uh, uh, I want to give opportunities for final thoughts. Um, um, and Congressman, can I speak? Uh, yeah, well, thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this. Uh, look, um, you know, if we don't do this, the fact of the matter is we're going to allow several states uh, to blatantly violate Article 1, Section 4 of the United States Constitution. Uh, it's very clear that if you look at Read Article 1, Section 4, and read, the, I think, the Federal Papers, I think it's 59, uh, where there's this, an extensive discussion uh, of, that they had of that issue. No state is to be allowed to set the terms and conditions for federal office holders. That's there. And that's what's going on in Texas. That's what went on in, in Georgia. Uh, when you say you will put in a mechanism that allow people to overturn the results of the election, they didn't single out 
state elections, they said of the election, which means they can determine whether or not a United States senator or a United States congressperson actually goes to Washington. I'm reminded of a quote by um, and Senator Bill Frist, actually, in advocating for the nuclear option uh, when they had the majority, that he said the filibuster is no, nothing less than a formula for tyranny by the minority. Um, and watching uh, state after state across the country and making it harder for uh, people to vote, to exercise their franchise, and to have the most fulsome democracy possible. I think um, we are seeing the, the filibuster prevent critical legislation from, uh, from being enacted to protect our democracy. So I um, want to thank really thank you, everything you're doing, Congressman, ever, and for the amazing commentary um, and thoughtfulness from you, Kim and, and Adam. Um, really, thank you very much and for both your time and your incredible insights. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for having me. This is a great pleasure. Thank you.